Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we welcome back Russell Gamerkin. Hi, Russell. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. So, Russell, you have a new book. Uh, we'll be touching on the new book today as well. Uh, but the topic of today's conversation, the historicity and originality of Genesis 1 to 11. Okay, so um, I do have a, a new book um, called Plato's Timaeus and the Biblical Creation Accounts, Cosmic Monotheism and Terrestrial Polytheism in the Primordial History, which is Genesis 1 through 11. Now, I had previously talked about Genesis 1 through 11 in my first book, Barosis and Genesis. Um, where I emphasize the Babylonian sources uh, in the primordial history. Um, scholars have long recognized that there are Babylonian ancient Near Eastern sources behind, uh, you know, the 10 generations before the flood that corresponds to the Sumerian king list that had 10 long lived generations. The Gilgamesh flood epic has significant parallels with the flood story in uh, Genesis. And my earlier book uh, said that the source of those Mesopotamian Babylonian traditions was Barosis, who was uh, a late writer in Greek, he wrote a history of Babylon and he translated the Gilgamesh epic, the Sumerian king list and all sorts of other sources from these exotic cuneiform sources into Greek to make them accessible. So my earlier book argued that um, all these Babylonian influences came by way of Barosis and they were very late. Now, my current book emphasizes Greek sources in the primordial history. So you have Babylonian sources. Uh, traditionally, uh, scholars have assumed that there were lots of Jewish sources. The uh, first creation account of Genesis 1 was uh, thought to be from the priestly source. So. Jewish priests writing that whole creation epic in Genesis 1. And then in Genesis 2 and 3, you had like a separate creation story that they said was from the Yahweh, because it uses the name Yahweh Elohim. Um, so there was a second supposedly Jewish source, the Yahweh. Um, so they recognized Babylonian and Jewish sources. But my latest book on Plato's Timaeus and the biblical creation accounts argues, yeah, they weren't really Jewish. Uh, I mean, these were Jewish authors, but they were using Greek sources for uh, both creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2 through 3. Um, that both of those actually come out of a very famous book by Plato called Plato's Timaeus, which was the most popular book of Plato in the whole ancient world. It was very widely read. Now, the plot line in Timaeus is uh, Socrates and Timaeus, who is uh, philosopher and astronomer from Italy, and a couple other guys, Critias and Hermocrates, um, they were all sitting around talking. And uh, anyway, Socrates invited Timaeus to um, tell his fellow Greeks how the, the universe came into existence, his theory of uh, cosmogony. So Timaeus launched into this uh, 
you know, this book long uh, speech on how the universe came into existence. And he said that the, uh, his starting premise was that, uh, that there was a, a creator, a demiurge, a craftsman who existed in the divine realm. Uh, he was being a, a divinity, he was completely good and everything that he created was good. And he created the cosmos uh, to be purely good and wonderful and actually in his own image. Uh, he was a living organism. He considered the cosmos to be a living organism and uh, and that it and that it had all the same qualities of goodness and intelligence and order that he had. Um, now, this, and, it, and he doesn't actually create it out of nothing, but he creates it out of a pre-existing chaos. The, uh, there was the divine realm, the realm of being where this God lived, this monotheistic, deity at the dawn of time and then the material realm was was utter chaos and confusion there was no light there was no earth water air everything was uh just running into everything else and it um until the divine presence uh entered into this material chaos and created order uh, the heavens separated from the earth and the water and the air, all the elements came into existence. There was light, light came into existence. Um, the seas separated from the earth. Anyway, the whole story that he has of this uh, craftsman who is uh, putting the world together it mirrors Genesis 1 practically from beginning to end. Um, you know, you have the, uh, the chaos of Genesis 1 verse 2, uh, you know, where uh, the earth uh, was without form and void and darkness over the face of the deep. You know, that, that chaos was the pre-existing world. And then Plato has light coming into existence as one of the very first things because when the God enters this chaotic universe, he separates out the elements and, and you can have light for the first time as an independent thing. And, uh, you know, it goes through with uh, separating the sky and the earth and, uh, you know, this uh, creator um, wants to create life too. Uh, first off, he creates the stars in the sky which Plato believed were gods uh, because they moved with intelligent order in circles around the earth. So he thought they were occupied by divinities. Okay, that's not in Genesis or the Bible, but um, this creator put the stars in the sky. He, he personally fashioned the sun and the moon and put them in the sky, just like in Genesis. Um, and he created various orders of life. Uh, he mentions the creatures uh, of the deep, the birds of the air, the animals on the land, all the same divisions as in Genesis 1. And, you know, after this creator is done creating this perfect cosmos, uh, the word cosmos means either order or beauty. So it's a beautiful, orderly universe. When he's done, he retires. He says, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to go rest now, basically, uh, just like the God in Genesis 1. So that whole, that whole story really, uh, it, it corresponds incredibly well with Genesis 1, including, uh, you know, Plato's God is rejoicing over how good everything is uh, that he creates. And, you know, in Genesis 1, 
there's this repetition, you know, um, this is good and that is good. And, uh, you know, a lot of the language is, is, uh, is repeated. So um, there's that argument that Genesis 1 comes from Plato's Timaeus. And my book also uh, identifies a little bit of Zeno the Stoic and some other influences here and there, but primarily uh, Timaeus. And uh, something really interesting, uh, esoteric, is Septuagint scholars who have looked at the translation of Genesis 1 into Greek have noted that the translators used Timaeus. They took specific phrases out of the Greek text of Timaeus, and they put those into the translation. Uh, you know, they could have translated the Hebrew all sorts of different ways, and some of these translations are surprising, but it mirrors uh, Timaeus. So uh, not only the Hebrew, but also the Greek translation, Genesis 1, um, very close to Timaeus. Okay, so that, that's really interesting. That, you know, it reveals Genesis 1 not as a creation myth, although this Demiurge is a little bit mythical. You know, he talks to, to his uh, sons and daughters, and he's a character. So there's a little bit of myth, but mostly it's science and theology. Um, in fact, I do a systematic comparison in my first few chapters of this book. Um, and I show that among all the Greek and ancient Near Eastern sources, only Plato's Timaeus and Genesis 1 had that mixture of science, theology, and uh, mythology. It's a very unique dialogue that he had. So, okay, that's Genesis 1. And it's very significant that we now know the source behind this creation account. When you get into Genesis 2 and 3, which is a little bit different, um, Genesis 2 and 3 is not really a creation account. I mean, this Yahweh Elohim doesn't create the stars or the universe or anything. It just creates mortal life. That's it. Well, Timaeus also had a second creation account. Um, he had the demi-urge from this eternal realm who creates, uh, you know, the whole universe is perfect and good and uh, the stars, especially the heavens are wonderful, uh, flawless and eternal because everything that the creator or craftsman makes is, uh, is good and, and eternal. Um, so what about mortal life? Well, there's a couple problems. Uh, you know, life on earth, all the creatures here, they die. So how could this eternal creator have created mortal life? Another thing, another big problem is uh, humans, they make all sorts of mistakes. Uh, you know, if you want to get theological, they sin. And they, uh, they do wicked things. Um, and is this eternal God, is he responsible for that? You know, are we going to lay that at his foot, uh, you know, at his feet? It's a question um, that they call uh, the Odyssey, God's responsibility for wickedness, you know, that whole question. So, you know, Plato couldn't have his perfect creator. Uh, making these mortal life forms that were mortal and flawed. So in Plato's Timaeus, you have basically a second creation story in which uh, Plato acknowledges the regular Greek gods, the gods and goddesses that they worshiped in Athens. And uh, he's kind of, you know, sure, why not? Um, heaven and earth and, you know, uh, all the who were gods and uh, 
all the all the rest of the gods of Athens. Um, he said that they were all the sons and daughters of this creator, this uh, craftsman, and that after the uh, Hemiurge had created the cosmos, he delegated the task of creating mortal life to his sons and daughters. These dinky gods who were running around on earth, you know, there's a couple in the underworld, there's some in the ocean, uh, some on Mount Olympus. But they're all within <clears throat> within the the world that the uh, that the creator had fashioned. Um, and he delegated to them the task of creating humans, uh, you know, birds, animals, fishes, all the rest. And you get the same thing in Genesis 2 through 3. Um, and this is another really kind of amazing breakthrough in this book that I just wrote. Uh, it's the first time that I've pointed out, that anyone has pointed out, this God, Yahweh, of Genesis 2 through 3 is not the same as the divine creator, Elohim, of Genesis 1. It's a different God. In fact, there's lots of gods in Genesis. There's the, uh, the gods in Genesis 1, 26 that said, let's create man in our image, male and female. So you have male and female gods who are in a divine council, and they're saying, let's create humans in our image, like us. Um, which is platonic language. He had, you know, you always have to have a wonderful model for creation, uh, for an artist to imitate. So, um, so these, and you have the sons of God in Genesis 6, verse 1 through 4. Uh, so the, and then at the Tower of Babel, too, you have multiple gods. And you have a couple references to multiple gods in uh, Genesis 2 through 3. Uh, like one of them says, uh, well, now man has eaten of the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, we'd better get him out of the, the garden or else he'll eat of the tree of life and then he'll be like us plural. So you have this one cosmic monotheistic God in Genesis 1. And then you have a host of lesser gods um, running around on earth in the rest of Genesis. Um, you know, they're also ref referred to in uh, uh, Deuteronomy as uh, uh, where the God Most High delegated the uh, different lands on the earth to his sons, the sons of God, and uh, delegated, uh, you know, Israel to, to Yahweh, because Yahweh was one of the sons of the supreme God, this creator God. He was not the chief God. He was not the God of creation, which is a pretty major insight. Um, I mean, you, here's, here's this, uh, here's this God in the Garden of Eden. Really, the creator of the whole universe is living in a garden on earth. Um, he, he goes in, he says, Adam, Eve, what's going on here? How come you're hiding? Uh, what's, uh, what's that? He did, he's not omniscient. He's not all powerful. In Genesis 4, uh, he says, uh, Cain, where's Abel? I don't see him. What happened to him? What's going on here? Um, you know, later on in Genesis, here comes Yahweh and his messenger. They're walking across the wilderness of Negev up to Abraham's tent to have, you know, to nosh with him, to have, a, you know, a little bit of lamb and talk over old times and decide the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, this is a terrestrial God. 
one of the, the 70 nations, uh, according to, um, well, in, in, in the Baal cycle at Ugrit, uh, the chief god El, he had 70 sons and daughters. In the books of Enoch, you have uh, the 70 angels over the 70 nations. You have 70 nations in the table of nations. So you have this whole thing of there being 70 gods on earth of which Yahweh is one. You know, uh, Chemosh is the god of the Moabites. And, uh, you know, and Yahweh is the god of the Israelites and so on and so forth. They're each local um, patron gods over their little territory. And, uh, you know, initially in Genesis 2 through 3, uh, God's territory is the land of Eden. And, you know, when he, when he finally expels Cain out into the world, uh, he drives him from his presence out of the land of Eden. So Yahweh is not present everywhere. In later texts, like in Jonah, he, Jonah is like, uh, I'm going to go to the far ends of the earth to escape the presence of God. And then there's no, God's presence is everywhere. Also in the Psalms, but not in Genesis. Uh, you know, Yahweh is localized to the land of Eden. And then Cain goes to other areas. And uh, he's afraid because of all the people living there. It's not just Adam and Eve. Uh He's afraid that wherever he goes, people are going to want to kill him because of what he's done. And, uh, you know, and he somehow he finds a wife out there. I mean, the uh, theologians from the Middle Ages you know, to the present, they've gone crazy. Like, where did, where did, who is Cain afraid of? How did he get a wife? And he, so they say, well, Adam and Eve were the only people around. They must have, uh, Cain must have been afraid of his uh, brothers and sisters chasing after him to murder him. And Adam and Eve, um, they take one of, uh, they take their daughters and send them to be the wife of the, the guy that has murdered their eldest son, seriously chased after him, you know, with a bridal bouquet or whatever. No, he went out, he found wives, he found people because there were nations all over the earth. Um, so you have different gods over different nations and different lands. Yahweh was one among many. Um, and that's also the picture that you have um, in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You have the sons of God. Uh, they're not coming down out of heaven. They're not fallen angels, like later traditions would say. They're, they're living on earth. And they see these women. They're beautiful. They're good. The same word in both Greek and Hebrew means either beautiful or good. It's used throughout Genesis 1. You know, God looked at this and that, and it was good. It was beautiful. It's wonderful. These are wonderful, beautiful daughters of men that the gods um, decided to marry. And they had offspring. The offspring were not, you know, they were giants, but they were men of renown. They were heroic. They were uh, semi-divine and uh, portrayed in a very positive way. Um, so... It's a very Greek picture where you have all these gods running around on earth. Lots of Greek gods married women. Uh, you, lots of them had sons that were uh, heroic, Hercules, among others. Um, it's a very Greek uh, cultural image you have here. And uh, in fact, in a later chapter in my book, uh, I talk about the influence of Critias on Genesis 1 through 11. Now, Critias 
was the sequel to Plato's Timaeus. Because uh, the Timaeus, he was just laying the groundwork for the story of another person uh, who was in that conversation named Critias, who was the grandson of the lawgiver Solon. And he claimed to have heard from Solon the story about this lost continent of Atlantis and how the people of Atlantis fought against all the people in the Mediterranean and how the heroic Athenians defeated them and saved the world. Well, anyway, Critias is the sequel to Timaeus. And Critias has a lot of parallels to Genesis 1 through 11 also. Uh, the paradise of Eden with uh, gardens and animals and rivers and, you know, wonderful paradise where the gods live together with humans. Um, that's very similar to Plato's description of Atlantis. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have a good parallel in anything in the ancient Near East. So, there, so there's that, but also Atlantis was ruled by, um, by the god Poseidon. Uh, and Poseidon married this beautiful young woman who was living in, in Atlantis named, uh, named Cleto. And the two of them had five pairs of twins, uh, you know, who became the 10 kings of Atlantis. The first one was Atlas, who, as we all know, is a giant, right? So you have a god marrying a beautiful woman, having offspring who are giants, who are, who Plato described as utterly noble rulers uh, over the original kingdom of Atlantis. But, uh, but over time, uh, Plato said this wonderful divine rule by the sons of God degenerated because every generation they kept on marrying these women, normal human mortal women. And so the divine element became less and less and less and they became more and more human. And at the end, uh, you know, they, their perfect rule degenerated into uh, one of lawless ambition and they decided to invade the rest of the world and uh, conquer the other nations. And, uh, and because of this wickedness, Zeus looks down upon them and says, we, we must punish Atlantis for their own benefit because this righteous race has, uh, you know, has, it has lots of problems and we have to correct them. So what does Zeus do? He sends earthquakes and rain and flood and he sinks Atlantis. That's the same plot as Genesis 1 through 9, shall we say, in the flood story, uh, which also has these, uh, the sons of God, they marry the daughters of men. They have these noble, heroic offspring, this race of heroes. And then over time, humanity becomes corrupted, just like in, uh, in Critias. And at the end, uh, you know, Yahweh, who apparently is the, the leader of the terrestrial gods, he's sitting in his council with the other gods and says, uh, you know, we're, all I see is violence. We're going to have to destroy these people, and uh, except for Noah and his family, and start over. So... There's flood stories in uh, ancient Near East. There's flood stories in Greek, in Greece, uh, lots of them. 
but on, only uh, only in Critias and in the biblical flood story is the reason for the flood wickedness. Because uh, Plato, he was the big moralist. He, uh, he saw ethics everywhere and he put ethics in all of his myths and he took this uh, the Greek flood stories and he turned them into ethical parables uh, and really a story uh, about how political wickedness originates because uh, Plato was concerned with human wickedness and political wickedness. Anyway, so my latest book talked a lot about uh, the Greek sources, especially Plato. Um, Plato's Timaeus and Plato's Critias, and also a bit of his uh, statesman and a couple others. And that's my latest book. In terms of the dating, I know, I know when this video goes out, I will get <laughs> quite a few uh, responses from Christian apologists. In terms of the dating between Plato and the, uh, the book of Genesis, I know we touched on this in the first video. Can you, can you give us the dates for that? Sure. Um, well, the Greeks, as I mentioned in the, in the other video, uh, the Greeks knew that without technology, humans couldn't survive. So therefore, uh, humanity must have been created basically at the same time as civilization. And therefore, they thought you could date how old uh, the world was, or at least how old humans were, by how old civilization was. Uh, and they, their estimates were kind of in the same ballpark as Genesis, which uh, <clears throat> said it was around 4000 BC. Plato really had one of the most, the oldest origins. He said that uh, the Egyptian civilization had arisen, uh, I think it was 9,000 years before his, his, his day. And these Egyptians remembered this Atlantis, which was like, a thousand years before that. So, uh, so he dated the world to be just a few thousand years old. And really that's where the Bible gets its uh, chronological frame of reference, same ballpark. And, uh, you know, Plato, uh, like Hessian, he said originally humans, when they lived with the gods, they didn't need technology because uh, the earth just sprang forth fruits and vegetables and food and they talked with the animals and they didn't need clothing and uh, you know it was it was paradise initially and then uh, in the age of Zeus though shortly afterwards that's when they needed technology and uh, so you have that same thing with uh, <clears throat> Genesis 2 through 3, you have this paradise. And then Genesis 4 on, you have the rise of technology, you have cities and um, metalworking and all the rest. So very similar uh, conceptual frame of reference where the history of humanity is really the history of uh, technology and civilization. And they both go back just a few thousand years. The pyramids are about the oldest things that you can see. And they're, you know, 10,000 years old. Uh, and so therefore it followed uh, that that's how old the world was. Uh, they didn't do the whole geology thing, you know. Uh, in fact, the Greeks found fossils up on mountaintops, seashells, this and that. And modern geology, you know, that was once the ocean bed and over millions and millions of years, it, it rose out of the sea. Uh, and that's how you have fossils on 
mountaintops and things like that. Uh, but the Greeks hypothesized uh, that's proof that there was a flood, the flood of Deucalion or some other flood. Uh, and so they, they worked that in with their recent, uh, you know, the world's only a few thousand years old. But uh, yeah, so, so the biblical worldview is uh, really not, you know, the few thousand years, it's not consistent with modern science. Uh, but it's, it's, it was cutting edge Greek science as of, you know, 500 BC. So if you want to stay stuck in 500 BC, you can, uh, you can keep that frame of reference, but the rest of the world has moved on. We know a little bit more since then. Um, so read a few science books. So going back to the flood story, clearly there were stories or myths circulating both in Samaria and in Greece prior to the biblical account. Yeah. So I think your book clearly shows that uh, the biblical account is by no means original. No, no. And, and scholars agree that it isn't. But um to the end of the 20th century they were focused exclusively on the ancient Near East and uh nobody until the last 10 or so years have looked at Plato and, and Timaeus and Critias and, and these Greek sources or sources of the Hellenistic era which is after 325 BC and the conquest of Alexandria nobody was looking at that for uh, biblical parallels or parallels to the biblical flood story. Uh, but now that modern scholars are looking at Greek literature for parallels, you know, a lot jumps out at you, including this Plato stuff. And finally, Russell, the book is available on Amazon at the moment. Yeah, and Rutledge and probably dozens of other places. Great. Russell, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Been a pleasure.